for campus. Dr. John received his bachelor degree in 1988 in US history from University of Wisconsin Madison. His master's degree in 1994 was in adult continuing education from Northern Illinois University. And his doctoral degree in 2000 was in adult and continuing education from Northern Illinois University. Um, the interesting presentation will be about race, work and technology, prospects for anti-racist adult education. Um, the presentation will explore the relationship between technology and growing precarity of work and nature, nature of race and prospects for anti-racist education. Dr. John, the floor is yours. Please, you can start. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So you've had all these fantastic presentations all day long, and now it's my turn. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, uh, the topic, as it's been described, um, trying to do way too much in a little amount of time, but I want to, I will touch on all of those elements in different, different um levels or, or amounts. Um, this is a part of a, a little broader uh, project and article that I've written that's in the sort of resource sections of the conference. So you can read that there. There's a handout there too, which is very similar to the PowerPoint I'm about to share. Um, so, um, oh, and the, earlier the idea, of if, if you have questions during the PowerPoint, you wanna stop me and ask, that's fine. Um, and hopefully we'll also have time at the end as well. So I come from the field of adult education um, and I'm very much interested in uh, learning and education that takes place within social movements and theory developed by social movement, social movements and social movement um, uh, intellectuals um, who, aren't considered necessarily intellectuals in our society because maybe they don't have, they don't work at universities, they don't have uh, an alphabet soup at the end of their name of PhD and EDD and all this sort of stuff. But I find that their work can be as relevant and oftentimes much more relevant than our own in terms of academia. So I draw on that work as a part of this presentation. So I'll share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. So that's my intro. So I'm raising sort of three questions in this presentation. Um, you know, race is oftentimes well, race is a social construct. And so one of the big things I want to do in this presentation is, well, what does it mean to say something as a social construct? Um, and so how can a, and the idea of saying it's a social contract, construct in a way is to say, well, it's not real, right? There's only one human race. So the idea of multiple races is a social construct. Um, there's no biological scientific basis for the notion of race, it's a social construct. So it's not real, but it is real. So what does it mean when we talk about something that's both real and not real at the same time? And in terms of race, we know that race has real impacts on people's lives. So then in terms of education and anti-racist education, how do we fight something that presents itself as both real and not real. Um, so I think, so part of this is, you know, the sort of the theory and conceptual work around race as a social construct. So I mentioned briefly uh, one of these. So sort of where I'm drawing this from is social science and historical research scholarship on race, um, social theory, particularly, um, from the critical and dialectical traditions of social theory. And as I mentioned earlier, the theory and practice, theory and practice of working class movement activists, or what's sometimes referred to as organic intellectuals. And if you don't know what, you're not familiar with that term, don't worry about it. 
if you are, you know that's coming from the work of Antonio Gramsci. So race is a social construct or idea. So any social construct has a history. It has a beginning and it has an end. So in terms of race, we know that race enters the English language in the 1500s. So it has a beginning. Race takes on its contemporary meanings as we sort of understand race today. And, and I'm thinking particularly in the US and perhaps in the uh, Atlantic Basin a little more generally, but a little more US focused here perhaps, takes on its contemporary meanings in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And as a construct, as an idea, it can be quite arbitrary and flexible. And there's no sort of linear development of the term from pre-capitalist into the capitalist era. In other words, race, the definition of race and how people are racialized changes over time and in quite arbitrary ways. Yet we know that race has these real social, political and economic impacts on people's lives. And there's winners and there's losers in terms of how race divides people. And we know that people's thoughts and experiences are racialized. So how do we fight this then? That's both real and not real at the same time. So from here, from movement intellectuals, Brooke Hare, um, Hagerty and Nelson Peary, they ask us to think about reality and to analyze reality in order to change reality and to think of it in terms of both the subjective, in other words, thinking in terms of ideas and the objective, in other words, real material conditions. So any social construct or any idea like race emerged and it merges and stays around with real impact under given objective conditions, given prevailing material relations. So they don't just appear out of nowhere and, the, and, an, and an idea has to be rooted in, a, in some sort of objective conditions. So then this couple of questions that emerge from that. When do ideas correspond to objective reality and when do they not? And so that question will sort of I'll raise that again when we get towards the end in terms of anti-racist education. And I think it also raises another important question. Can we always substitute racist ideas with anti-racist ideas? When does that work, if, if at all? When does that work? When is it most fruitful? And where is it most fruitful to do so? So race emerges in a particular context of the development of capitalist relations between people. The idea of race, the sort of the sub subjective idea, the social construct has flourished along with the flourishing of the objective relations of capitalism. And, you know, I think like, if you look at Eric Williams work on capitalism and slavery, Du Bois's work as well, I mean, that's pretty well documented in, in, in the historical literature. So, but one thing, as much as race was created by the slaveocracy and the dominant classes in the 17th and 18th centuries, it's also been miseducated, drawing on Woodson's term of miseducation, it's also been miseducated into the minds of all of us. The slaveocracy, the middle classes, the working classes. So in a certain sense, you could say that race has flourished both vertically. In other words, you know, if you read sort of um, Howard Zinn's The People's History of America, he, he details quite specifically all the sort of laws that were set up to begin to divide people um, along lines of race in order for, um, to perpetuate slavery in the United States. But there's been this top-down imposition, imposition, but it's also spread and flourished semi-horizontally among people. And this division that's been created 
has created what oftentimes is referred to as privilege or racial privilege. The thing, I think one thing to consider though, is that without the objective conditions of expanding wealth through capitalist relations, the social construct of race as we understand it could not take hold and flourish. So this idea of race beginning as a part of the control of labor and particularly the control of enslaved peoples in the Americas and in particularly in the United States. And so this is a well-established idea as well in the historical and sociological research about the creation of a race as a form of control of labor. And in recent years, this has come up and also in terms of how then policing has played a role in the historical role of policing in slavery. So I want to just share this very brief video from uh, Professor Muhammad on the history of labor control uh, and the formation of policing. Of course, people intuit and, and commonsensically understand that uh, as a system of violent control, over human beings, slavery required uh, the use of violence to control people. And so for uh, the entire period going back to the mid-1600s and to the early 1700s, colony after colony from New York and Massachusetts to South Carolina uh, and Virginia passed a series of, uh, of black codes or Negro acts, various laws that were designed to empower everyday white citizens uh, with the responsibility and let me be clear the duty to serve in an official capacity uh, to surveil monitor to track and when caught to dispense corporal punishment against enslaved african people in the colonies it was the largest bureaucracy dedicated to a form of policing uh, that we recognize today and it was everywhere in the colonies. By the time the nation was born uh, in 1790, while there were gradual abolition laws that took root in many Northern colonies, uh, the antebellum experience of free blacks was little different. What went from a slave patrol became the responsibility of a growing cohort of modern police officers. And this problem from slavery to freedom simply changed uniform and changed um, the instruments and tools uh, of keeping track of people of African descent, uh, and it, it expanded in the United States of America. But there's another part of this history that I think is really important, and that is that policing in the broadest sense was always about policing the essential workers of this society. And this is true in societies and countries all over the globe. And what do I mean by essential workers? Meaning the people who are at the bottom of the society, their freedom has always been constrained by more privileged and more elite, and in this country, whites. Now, whites, of course, range in class. And so one of the ironies is that both poor whites in many parts of the country were policed, especially when they challenged political authority, when they challenged economic inequality. But at the same time, they were able to join police forces. Of course. So continuing with this question of how do we fight something that's both real and not real, people who are objectively unequal cannot unite subjectively or around the idea or an ideal of unity. Objective racial inequality has always inhibited the ideal of class or cross racial unity. So in the picture on the right here, I have the slogan that was raised by the labor movement in the US in the 1930s of Negro and white unite and fight. And uh, Nelson Peary in the reference I'm talking there, he was a, a, a worker labor activist um, in that time period. You know, and, he always, and he always talked about how you know, it was a great slogan, unite and fight. And yet, as he was a black worker, as a black worker, he lived in objectively unequal reality than his fellow white workers. And so as much as they tried to put forward the slogan of racial unity, you know, um, of class unity across a racial divide, they lived objectively unequal realities. And therefore, they, they, it simply couldn't happen. 
um, as much as they wanted to. So I think that raises the question then of, we have to know when, where, and how racist ideas can be replaced with anti-racist ideas. And that's a central question then for anti-racist education. Now, this is getting into now sort of technology and the changing nature of work and possibilities for anti-racist education. So everything with a history like race is in constant motion and change. Changing objective conditions offer new possibilities and require us to be constantly reassessing old ideas in relation to the changing objective realities. Old ideas or prevailing ideas can lose their material anchor if objective conditions change. So when is it when ideas and objective conditions begin to mismatch given the constant motion and change of social reality? So new realities require new approaches, but nothing dies on its own. So everything that's created by humans like social constructs like race and racism have to be challenged and defeated by humans themselves. So one thing that I wanna raise here, and this is a huge topic and I'm just gonna raise it briefly. Technology, just a general point here, technology is the most dynamic element in any social formation or society. And as we change our technology, we change ourselves and the objective conditions in which we live. Social, political, and economic relations or ideas are slower to change than technology. Miseducation creates a certain inertia, um, and but we run into these contradictions between change, changes in certain sectors of society and non-change in others. As objective conditions change, ideas aligned with the old conditions begin to potentially lose their staying power. But again, they have to be challenged. These changing object objective conditions create space for new ideas corresponding with the new conditions that are in formation. So what am I more specifically talking about here? In recent decades, qualitatively new robotic microchip-based automating technology is fundamentally transforming society today. And one of the things that's happening is it's creating a new class of poor. So in globally, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, says that 61% of the world's workers are informally employed. And the economic fallout of the pandemic is accelerating this change and exacerbating it as well. So race is a social construct, but it has objective material privileges to be had, to be taken, to be fought for or given, or not to be had or not to be given based on the social construct of race. Once the objective conditions which make these real privileges possible, space is opened to challenge the idea of race. And I'm getting close to the end here. So today we are witnessing the formation of a multiracial class that's increasingly outside the basic prevailing relation of production and distribution in a capitalist society. And that basic relationship is you find a job to get a wage or a salary to buy the things you need or think you need. With labor replacing technology, there's this growing precarious sector of society finding itself increasingly with less access to that basic relationship or on the margins of that relationship. And this has been studied globally. I have here you know, multiple ways in which this growing sector of humanity is being discussed. Class, the new poor, the precariat, maybe one that you've heard before, informal working class, the informal sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And surplus populations and, and all this sorts of stuff that's being analyzed 
all across the globe in terms of the changing nature of work given new technologies today. And this, the point here then is what does that mean for race, racism and anti-racist education? So outside that basic relationship of capitalism, this new multiracial class is outside the primary relationship through which racial privilege and disadvantage are distributed. So among the growing multiracial new poor, the winners of the racial divide have less and less to gain from that divide. So it is within this new class of objective equals. Remember I was talking about Nelson Perry in the 1930s and being objectively uh, unequal. So within this new class, of objective equals where the social construct of race can be is where the social construct of race can be most effectively challenged. And we can see this new class organizing multiracially in movements among the poor today. Um, so if you look the poor people's campaign, if you've been following, you know, the work of Reverend Barber um, is just one example. Uh, the fight for 15 among low-wage workers and the growing movements of unionization among multiracial low-income workers, this battle over access to safe water, the new Black Lives Matter protests, and movements of survival everywhere that are taking place today. So there are objective conditions today that favor anti-racist education. With an anti-racist education, that which the new multiracial class has in common becomes increasingly obvious, as does racism as a tool of racial divide. But Nelson Peary, who I had referenced uh, previously, challenges us, however, and says, racism cannot be fought with anti-racism. It has to be fought with practical, political activity of unity. In other words, you can't just fight an idea with ideas. You have to fight an idea with ideas based in practical political activity for unity. And you know, he says that um, the practical fight for unity where there is economic equality is the way to deal with a social construct such as race. So these are my references and that's my presentation. So we can go to the q and i I'll, uh, Q and A, I'll stop sharing. So I know that was quite a bit to probably take in. I'm glad to sort of revisit any of it or if you'd like to have any questions. You had a term called new uh, objective uh, something class or a uh -huh. term. What, what was it? What was it? And can you explain the term? Well, two perhaps two things there. One, this idea that um, you know it used to be it used to be that technologies were labor saving. You know, and I think a really, a really interesting example of this is if you look at, for example, the, um, uh, and, and since we're dealing with race and, and slave and the development of racism and the category of race in the US in terms of slavery. So it used to be that, you know, you would introduce in, um, in um, cotton production, the mechanization of cotton production displaced thousands of cotton workers uh, in the US. And so it became not just labor saving technology that allowed for workers to be more productive on the job, but technology that actually pushed workers out of certain sectors of society. And so with the new technologies we're seeing today that can replicate human labor without the presence of humans. It's a fundamentally new technology that's not just labor saving, but labor replacing. And so that creates a new sector of 
society, a new class, or it fundamentally transforms the working class in that it, the working class's access to full-time, stable, permanent labor becomes less and less likely. And so, you know, some people have talked about, you know, this is transforming the working class or it's creating this new, um, new class um, or a workless class. And so the idea is that racism as a, as a tool to divide people and particularly to divide the working class and its development, particularly in the terms of divi uh, dividing whites and blacks in terms of the perpetuation of slavery in the US, um, that happens and can, can flourish when there's actual privileges to be had. So I give that example, again, the, the example that Nelson Peary talked about in the 1930s when he was worker and they were, you know, they were trying to build this cross uh, racial unity among white and black workers. You know, and he'd give, the, he'd give the examples and it's not like this does not exist at all anymore, but the point is that the trajectory of this is that among, among this growing precarious sector of society, there's less and less privileges to be drawn from racism. And so with less and less privileges to be had from it, the idea of race becomes less stable because there's less to be had from it. So when you have people who are more objectively equal, there's more opportunity there to challenge a social construct, an idea like racism that supposes some people are better than others. When you're objectively equal, there's more opportunity to challenge that idea. So. Can you give us maybe a specific example of being objectively equal? So what would be a concrete example? Yeah, so just an, another example. So in, um, drawing from the work of uh, Willie Baptiste and the Pedagogy of the Poor. So this draws on a lot of work that, that happened and that's hap that happened and is continuing to happen in Philadelphia among um, well, the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, the University of the Poor, um, the sort of general welfare rights unions that are going on, you know, organizations that are going on today. Um, and so they, you know, they they discuss in their work that they they work in a multiracial setting. So, for example, in Philadelphia, they have um, um, working class, low income, poor, whatever term you want to use, uh, African Americans, Latinx folks, white folks, um, and they, you know, and they talk about how in that work they build racial unity, not through anti-racist workshops, not through trying to bank anti-racism in the heads, of, into the heads of people, but building on the common issues and the common problems that low-income whites, blacks, Latinx folks have. And it's through that practical political activity that people come to an understanding of the commonalities that they have. And now that were, and so the argument, so, and, and it's not like, oh, that's something that's just happening now. But the idea being that given the growing precarity of work in this growing sector of society, mm -hmm. in this precarization, that that overcoming racial division becomes much more um, um, probable given the objective actual conditions folks are living. So it's not about trying to convince people, it's not about trying to convince people to give up their racism when their racism actually benefits them substantially. And so, so it's about building 
practical political struggle and unity over common causes among folks who live objectively growingly equal lie, uh, realities. I think there's a question in the chat. Yes, there is a question from Jessica. Um, can you see it, Dr. John, or do you want to read it? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see it. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, so the, the I mean, I, I, I want to sort of be clear here. So the idea, I'm, I'm not arguing that, um, that common disadvantage automatically leads to unity and it doesn't automatically erase racism. So, you know, one of the points I was making, you know, one of the points in the slide was that everything that's human created by humans, like social constructs, like any social construct, particularly race though, has to be defeated by humans. You can, you can replace one idea with another idea, but there's times and places when that will be much more likely to be successful. And so I gave the example in the 1930s when, you know, Nelson Peary was saying, you know, as much as we tried to build this unity, it was like, I had the crap job, like all my fellow black workers and my fellow white workers simply did not. And so how are we gonna, how are we gonna build unity when, when we live such objectively unequal lives? It was really impossible, even though the slogan was fantastic and we all bought into the slogan, the most conscious workers. And yet it just it it was not the time or place for that slogan to really take root in the objective realities at that time period. And so um, you know, uh, specific examples of other places in the world. Um um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think we can think of um, places around the world where we see, I, I, you know, I'm, you know, I would, I would draw on some of my experience and knowledge in Latin America. So, for example, um, in, I'll just draw on Chile, for example, because my wife's from Chile and we do research there and visit. So, you have, um, race plays out very differently though in different different areas. So I'm a little reluctant to go too much into detail here. But for example, so you have um, call center workers in Chile, who some are Chileans, some are Afro-Colombians, some are Afro-Haitians. And so you have work among um, uh, the efforts of um, people organizing call center workers or miners in the North. And so they deal with the same question of as, as the work becomes more precarious, there's opportunities to this sort of racial divisions among say Afro-Colombians and as immig uh, immigrant African Colombians in Chile alongside uh, uh, native Chilean workers living quite objective. Quite objective. Equal lives um, and finding ways to build unity as workers across this racial division, which is quite sharp, actually, as sort of anti immigrant sentiment builds there. So, um, It's quite an interesting perspective. Uh, thinking about the times when, um, you know, when we think about privilege, and the, if I'm understanding correct, but you're saying that when privilege does not really become part of the issue, then we have the opportunity to start to have conversations beyond what the divide was. Is that is that what I'm understanding correctly? And yet, I think about the conversations around race and power and privilege, right? Because even where there's not as much of a distinction around uh, privilege, there still is a distinction around power and who is going to control 
what happens and shape the culture, shape the environment, shape the political uh, landscape and all of those things. And I just wonder from a practical perspective how we ever get there. And, you know, this week is the... Um, IDERD, the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is this week on March 21st, which you, I'm sure you're aware of. I'll be having some mm -hmm. conversations with people about this tomorrow in interviews. And we have a, a really great hope that we're going to be able to move beyond this. But how do you get beyond the power issue? Yeah, you know, um, I remember, you know, the, this presentation comes from um, both my scholarship and my teaching. Um, and I remember, I remember a few years ago, I was teaching and I was sort of presenting these ideas and I raised the, um, I said, you know, I said, you know, this whole idea of this sort of growing objective uh, equality um, uh, in, in this growing new class. And I said, you know, it was in class and I said, so for example, if you're, if you're white in the homeless shelter, sleeping on a bunk next to an African-American, what, what racial privilege do you really have if you're homeless, if you're both homeless? How are you extracting your privilege? what is your privilege anymore once you're homeless and have can barely survive? And one of the students raised their hand and she's an African-American woman, she raised her hand and she says, well, you're still white. And- um, That's that's exactly right. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, and so, you know, that really made me think quite a bit. And, um, you know, I think, I still feel like what, what then, what is the privilege? What are the privileges you're actually drawing from that anymore? When, where, and how? Because I think one, one big privilege in terms of economic inequality has been stripped from you, but not all of them, right? Um, and so the, the idea here is that the trajectory, again, this is not like on off sort of thing, but the trajectory is of less and less objective privileges, but it's not like they go, they instantly go away. And so I think you could think about, well, there would be times when you could, you know, obviously this is just sort of an abstract example, um, but you could think of points where privilege would still prevail. Yeah, so. So that, yeah Dr. Horst, uh, that, that seems to be an extreme example, um, but what happens in day-to-day -day lives of people of color, uh, including Black, Asian, Hispanic, and so on? Uh, for example, like if you walk on the street, um, in some cities, um, mostly blacks are uh, stopped by the police, right. for example. And also, if you uh, if your uh, children goes to highly white dominant school, let's say ninety percent white, and uh, so or the racism is contextual. So that we are like, for example, in Central PA, uh, there is a white dominant population. And those ones who get into trouble, let's say white boys, white boy and Asian boy uh, got into trouble. And the, the Asian boy usually gets uh, uh, like pick, picked on by a teacher and so on. So um, yeah, we need to take a look at the phenomenon, uh, the general phenomenon, and also the, at the core of, of racism, why we fight uh, uh, against racism would be related to uh, the wounds that uh, people uh, develop uh, through uh, differential treatments. So what, how, what, what are the implications of those uh, phenomena uh, on other education? So that would be my question. Yeah, did, did anybody else wanna jump in on that related, semi-related? 
my jumping in is to agree <laughs> with the comment as the mother of four children who now are young adults, right? And, and knowing what it meant to see the differences in someone who's worked in the educational system as well as in corporate. So totally, certainly, uh, Kim Jun, 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying. Please no, give me credit yeah. for trying. I go by Jun, so you can just call me Jun. Jun. Uh, the, totally in agreement with that. When we start to look at racist behaviors, even as we were talking earlier today about the implications around technology, um, profiling, right? And and even if if you live, if you're a black or if you're a person of color, whatever that is, right? If you're a person of color and you live in an affluent neighborhood and you have the same privilege in a sense as other people in your neighborhood, but your child is is one, you know, is a person who is considered maybe to be a little higher risk in terms of behaviors simply because of the color of their skin or their ethnic difference. So this, this is challenging because it, it leans into the bias that's there. And so I, I don't think I'm answering your question. I'm just agreeing with you to say that it requires a complete mindset shift. And if we don't get into a space where we get to know each other and learn more about what we have in commonality. And I think about my, my neighborhood as a neighborhood um, substantially um, populated by uh, people of Indian and Asian um, backgrounds. And so we get to know each other. But until we get to know each other, what we know about each other is what we've seen in the media. Yeah. But that bonding, getting to know each other is what starts to break down the racial barriers. Yep, yeah, I agree. Yes, Tanya, and I also agree that when you, in the case of you're talking about the homeless, an African American or person of color versus somebody who's white, getting out of that condition is always going to be a, a lot easier based on the color of the skin. Because there's a lot of assumptions, you know, one person may be viewed as being, oh, that's a nice person, because just like Tanya said, you know, what, what is shown on the media sometimes portrays African-Americans as being more negative, more violent, more, um, you know, it, it, it's, just, it's just part of the, the facts. So it's gonna be a lot harder for them to change and to get another opportunity to get out of their condition. Yeah, this starts on a one-on-one -on -one basis sometimes. I mean, the political systems don't um, permit it because let's face it, political systems are designed around power and power structures, right? And, and, and retaining privilege is part of that, but money is also a part of that. Let's not pretend that it's not, it absolutely is. But on a one-on-one, -on -one, from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, um, if we, each one of us ask our own self, if we ask ourselves, what is it that I personally am going to do to educate myself even more, to engage more in communities that are different from myself and to be an ally, even if I'm a person of color, and if I'm not a person of color, to be an ally as well, even if I don't understand it, even if I don't get it right all the time. So what is my own individual personal accountability toward making the change? And of course, being the change that we want to see but we can't change structures without having some level of individual commitment and then being willing to participate in the system. Just, uh, just a couple of my own comments. I don't wanna you know, take anyone else's time. Someone else may have a perspective on it. How are we doing time-wise? Um... I think I think we're good so far. Like I mean, our presentation is supposed to finish by three twenty-five, so oh, okay. we have ten minutes. If someone okay. would like to raise a question, or you would like to talk about anything, Doctor John, or or those documents that you shared, especially the article that you shared. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I mean, at this just sort of reply. You know, I mean, I'm I'm in an agreement with what everyone's saying. Um, I think two points, two points that I would say on just sort of drawing back on the on my presentation. You know, I do think the 
um, thinking of the social construct of race, both subjectively and objectively, the idea elements of it don't, so racism or thinking racially don't just go away. They have to be fought over. But I, I would, I, I will stick to my point that changing objective condition. I mean, so the, the theoretical point I'm making here is that there's a there's a there's a relationship between ideas and material reality. And ideas flourish, any idea flourishes or doesn't flourish based on the objective conditions that are prevailing. And as those conditions change, ideas can weaken and have less staying power. And so anti-racist education and fighting the ideas, fighting racism at the level of ideas can be more successful have more potential now than in previous periods. And among sectors of society who are living more objectively equal realities. And they're not completely, and I know I'm saying, I'm not, you know, everybody's raised some really good, you know, counter factuals, I don't know if that's the right term, to showing that, well, it's not exactly equal. No, it's not. And I'm, I'm, I, that's clear to me. I, I think it, it's clear to pretty much everyone. Yet, it's a, it's, a, it's a transformation. The trajectory is that more and more people's lives are becoming more and more precarious. So that that period in which the period in which racism as a tool to gain individual and collective advantage is diminishing among a growing sector of the population. <clears throat> could I, could I, um, I'm, thank you for this. I've just been listening and processing, but thinking about it as why that is, um, I, I think we're approaching uh, and I know a lot of anti-racist practitioners approach their work without labels, right? And that I feel like it makes a, it, what we've been better at doing is making the conversation more inclusive um, and not beyond race. Cause I've worked from in, you know, like the intersections of race, gender, class and ability. But I, I, think practitioners, I think consultants and practitioners alike have been able to use better inclusive language to bring more people in versus it being things changing. I, that's how I would, because I feel like I'm not, I'm 37 years old, nothing has changed. And it's, I would even argue some things have gotten worse. <laughs> Amber, so, so agreed. I continue, Amber, to think about the question of why in the United States of America, periodically people have to evaluate why I would have to be able to have someone vote on the fact that I could vote. Someone would have to approve that I could continue to have voting rights in 2023. Why is that? Exactly. And right? And the voting rights conversation now has, we've been able to include white women because, you know, now without access to abortion and then even men by proxy through these anti-abortion laws, preventing or in decreasing privacy. So now we're able to figure out that language, but like, why are, yeah, why are we even having to have the discussion to figure out that language. It's not because it's getting better. Um, I think we are just getting better at connecting with people um, to, to discuss this. I don't, I really just don't see anything changing. 
Well, I think for me that that speaks to the growing multiracial nature of social movements among working class people today. I mean, you look at like the unionizing campaigns that are going on today, the poor people's movements that's going on today. I mean, you're seeing um, uh, these these battles around access to like clean, safe drinking water. I mean, these are involving um, multiracial, you know, uh, working class uh, cross racial movements where people are finding common cause across racial division for really basic basic questions of survival. You know, we need access, you know, in Michigan, we need access to clean drinking water. Uh, you know, um, low wage workers are organizing across racial lines because they can't put food on the table. Um, and they're finding common cause across uh, racial division because they're, they're building movements for for political power to to create social change across racial division. So that, that's uh, from a maybe survivor uh, perspective. Uh, that, that's the lowest need, Maslow's needs hierarchy, lowest level. Uh, what about the sense of belongingness? What about self-actualization um, and things like that? And um, those minorities are. Uh, constantly feel that they are excluded and they are ignored, their feelings are hurt and so on. And um, I have the option to go back to Korea. I'm from South Korea. Uh, I uh, Sometimes I regret that I ra I'm raising my son in uh, the U.S. because of the uh, wounds and uh, hurtful feelings he had to go through. And if we, he were, uh, he, yeah, he were in the South, raised, he were, raised in uh, South Korea, he didn't have to go through all this. So it's a real, uh, if you look at uh, each one's uh, life, um, and it's not something that you, uh, my, my personal opinion, it's not something that you can approach it from a societal or economics perspective to race. It, it's a highly individual. That's my point of view. Well, it's both though, isn't it? I mean, we didn't defeat slavery one slave at a time. I mean, it was the general, as Du Bois talked about, it was the general strike of the slaves that forced upon the North to take up the cause of the abolition of slavery, right? And that, and that does not deny, right? That does not deny the individual actions and also individual horrendous pain and suffering and et cetera of, of slavery, yet, um, and ultimately, every individual had, you know, in the in that circumstance, had to make a decision of, you know, which side are you on, what are you going to do, et cetera. Um, so I, I think I think we can hold both together at the same time, and how we sort of figure out how to work those together at the same time, um, you know, and in terms of belonging, I mean, I, you know, the you know, I think people, I mean, my work in social movements, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I can't, I don't know that I can make comparisons, but there is a tremendous sense of belonging that emerges when people engage in political struggle. And that when they begin to fight for something that's larger than themselves, but within which they see themselves. You know, so I mean, there's you know research on how you know um, there's a sort of a psychological healing through struggle. Now there's also burnout and exhaustion, physical harm that can come, et cetera. But there's also a sense of like people find themselves and they find who they are in. I mean, you talk to any any activist, they'll, you know, they'll talk about how their involvement in, um, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, or, or, and, you know, women's movement, etc. you know, changed who they are, changed their identity, empowered them individually, et cetera, et cetera. And, and at the same time, struggles, sacrifices, 
you know, they sort of go hand in hand as well. But I do think, you know, you can find that sense of belonging um, in movement. What about white people in movement? And especially if the movement is anti to what they've experienced, like cap, like uh, reparations, right? If we're building a movement towards reparations, how are white folks um, engaged or organized if the reparations mean they're going to have to give up their capital or, yeah? Um, well, one, it, I think it depends, you know, I mean, there's a whole lot of white folk who don't have any capital to give up and increasingly so, right? I mean, most poor people in the United States are white. Um, disproportionately, not well, the Well, I case, would disagree but, that they don't have capital get, to give up because if there's land, um, if there's, um, you know, if there's labor or protection of um, people in those movements, there's capital white people can always give, even if they don't have like monetary capital, they have other types of assets that they can use their whiteness to, to help movements. So poor white people are still, I, you know, I'm in Appalachia, so <laughs> poor white people still can do things on behalf of like Build movement building, especially reparations, too. Yeah, I, you know, I think, so. you know, and I, yeah. Um, um, you know, I, in, in and among working class people, the idea of racial unity, I think, becomes uh, more probable, more appealing, more likely something to build around when, when you're dealing with folks who have less to gain and extract from racial privilege. If you're among people who extract gain from racism, you're less likely to have racial unity. It's a very uh, idea. Um, may I um, uh, mm -hmm. It's idea that, like, for example, in our program, we are we have a highly diverse uh, body of uh, students, a body of diverse students. Um, so we have, um, yeah, many uh, students from all over the almost all over the world, um, and we don't really talk about race. But uh, we unite because we pursue the common goal of uh, toward uh, self-actualization, community building, and so on. So we, our students feel included. So ideally, I think that's a really good direction. But the problem is uh, those ones who don't have those causes. Um, so in a way, I think what you mentioned uh, seems to be really important. Um, I, I want to push back on that just a little bit to say that because this was something uh, we had discussed in Dr. Brendel's workshop around agnostic practitioners. And I think a something that I would critique the program is the lack of race in the conversation being part of a global program. Race, every, every country experiences anti-Blackness, every single one, every policy globally regardless of what industry, regardless of what country is rooted in anti-Blackness. Like we're starting in a place where we're looking at melanated people, we're looking at um, Afro um, indigenous or Afro people um, outside of Africa that are through other types of colonialism or imperialism are there, right? Um, and the conversations we're having in the OD program, they're agnostic in the context of like excluding humans and race is a very, I, I use race when I'm talking 
to my colleagues even um, in Europe, in whereas they're focused on ethnicity, for them to understand nationality issues, you still have to process race. Like, how do people know what your religion is if they're not looking at your skin or they're not looking at your garb or they're not looking at your, like there's, race is everywhere. And I think the biggest export of Europe is racism. <laughs> so, so like we're, I, I think a big critique of the OD program is the lack of conversation around race and the interventions like appreciative inquiry where it's, if we're looking at appreciative inquiry somewhere in like Australia, which was part of my program that I, you know, the professor was responsive, but it was like, you're looking, you're approaching appreciative inquiry and, and it's a practice of assimilation in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. But why is it a practice of, of assimilation? What do the Aborigines experience in Australia in counter to, or even white Aborigines experience in comparison to black Aborigines, right? That conversation never happened until I brought it up. And it's, I think it's important whenever we talk about appreciative inquiry. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think uh, that's something that we need to work on, uh, especially in the MPS ODC program. It's highly content oriented at this point. So, yeah. Okay, so I hate um, I hate to stop in this interesting, um, very interactive discussion here, but I think it's the time to have a little break um, before we resume the, the third session at 340. So thank you, Dr. John. Thank you everyone for um, making it very valuable, interesting session. Well, I wish we could continue. I mean, we're sort of really getting into it now. So, uh, I mean, well, we have been, but yeah, I, thank yes. you so much everyone for, we put Dr. Her, John's um, um, email in chat, so please, you can reach out yeah. to him, contact him, feel free to do that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I really enjoyed the, the discussion, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.